All right, so um, this is probably the most exciting place I've ever presented at. Um, <laughs> it's very, I asked Jennifer if there was a dress code and, um, and I'm, she was like looking at me like, What's, what are you talking about? And so I was very happy uh, not to have to wear a black suit. Um, so I, I took out my most colorful outfit. Um, so this is really great, and uh, I'm really, really excited to be here um, at a place that actually, uh, you know, is involved in creating art to talk about this particular piece, which is probably my most favorite project. Uh, I'm a finance academic. Um, this is not really finance, uh, but uh, fortunately, because there's prices in it, people think it's finance, and so it's getting a lot of play in the finance market, which is um, really good. All right, so let me uh, tell you what we do in this uh, paper. Uh, and I should say it's co-authored with uh, three men. I'm the woman. Um, and, uh, you know, which is interesting for them and also interesting for me. Okay, so uh, the starting point, let me just put this into perspective, is uh, Nahalan 1971, uh, which um, I assume many of you have read. And I'm going to give it to my graduate students. I discovered this piece only recently and I decided I'm going to give it to my graduate students as an example of how to write. I mean, this is like one of the most impressive pieces of writing uh, that I'm aware of, that I've seen recently, uh, and this is just such an amazing piece. And of course, you know, Nochlin asked, uh, why have there been no great women artists? Okay, so that was 1971, right? Uh, Davis, in 2015, wrote an article called, Why Are There Still So Few Successful Female Artists? So between 1971 and 2015, doesn't seem like much has changed, right? So how is that possible? Okay, so what are the standard stories? Why there are no great, great female artists? Uh, so the first one is genetics or talent, right? Uh, and Nochlin describes this as um, the argument, which is not her argument, but she puts the argument out there, this is what people say, uh, is that women do not have the golden nugget of artistic genius, okay? So is it possible that women just can't paint? Okay, we're gonna actually take this argument seriously. Okay. Uh, another argument is uh, there's style or taste. Okay, so maybe women have a style of painting that simply does not appeal, for example, to collectors who tend to be more male because traditionally men have had more money than women have had. And you need money to buy art. Okay, so maybe that's the explanation that um, nobody buys women's art because they don't like the themes in women's art. Uh, and then another explanation is institutions or culture. Uh, so one uh, way in which institutions matter is, well, historically women did not have access uh, to uh, the painting of nude models, right? And so therefore, because you don't have access to the nude models, you may paint worse, and so you produce worse art simply because of institutional barriers, okay? So that, as Nochlin describes it, it's the question of the nude. Uh, so that's one way in which institutions can matter, and another way in which institutions can matter is uh, people may just say, well, you know, it's painted by a woman, must be bad, right? It's attitudes or bias, or discrimination, okay? And um, an example of this kind of, um, uh, of uh, cultural uh, attitude is uh, uh, a quote by um, George Baselitz, or Georg Baselitz, who said, um, what's the biggest problem with women artists? None of them can actually paint. And that was um, a quote from him in 2013, so this is not like a, a, an old, quote or anything, this is a fairly recent quote by a very prominent artist who thinks that women just can't paint. Okay, so these are the standard stories, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to figure out, well, which one of these sort of holds water, uh, and uh, I would say that we have very compelling evidence, and I'll show you the evidence. Uh, we have very compelling evidence that it's not genetics, it's not style or taste, and I'll show you some evidence that maybe there's a bit of a style thing going on, but that doesn't explain why, for example, 
uh, prices for women's art is generally lower than prices for men's art. Okay, so it's not style. Uh, and we're gonna come down now, I see that my nice circles have all moved, but anyhow, this is, uh, we're in an artistic environment, right? So, um, so those circles are supposed to be around institutions and culture and attitudes, right? So uh, our evidence is consistent with institutions and culture uh, playing a big role in explaining why women have different outcomes in the art market than men. Okay, so how do we do this? So what we do is we look at the auction market for art. Um, and we have a huge sample of auction prices. We have 1.9 million auction transactions and the associated prices and lots of characteristics associated with arts. So we know like the size of the painting, we know the auction house, we know the location, uh, we even know um, like the actual auction. Um, so we have lots of information about all of this art. Uh, the art has been sold in 49 different countries. So there's variation across countries. Uh, and we have a lot of artists in our sample. So 69,189 artists and about 11,300 of these are female. Okay, so we have this huge sample of art auction prices. Uh, and what we do first is we show that there's a big discount in prices for art by women. And I should say also, these are all paintings, okay? Uh, now, I'm not sure if you can see this very well, but uh, in the entire sample, so what I have in that graph at the top, uh, the blue bar is um, the uh, average price for art by women, and the red bar is the average price, oh, sorry, I'm moving around, uh, for uh, art by men, and so you see the blue bar is uh, pretty small relative to the red bar, uh, and in fact, it's about 42% smaller. Okay, so on average, among all these paintings, the prices for the paintings by women is 42% smaller than the prices for the paintings by men. Okay, so that's a huge gap. So people talk about the gender wage gap, Right? People make a big fuss about are women and men paid the same for work in the workplace? Uh, this is much bigger than the gender wage gap. Okay. Um, so, okay, so that's interesting, right? So now the question is, why does this exist? Okay. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and I should also point out, so that's in the raw data, if you exclude transactions over a million, uh, then the discount shrinks to about 19%. That's still huge. Okay, so no matter how you cut the data, this is like one of the most robust findings I've ever, you know, normally if you do, um, you know, you do these uh, analyses, you know, I've looked at women on boards and things like that. Uh, it's very difficult to find a result that no matter what you do, it always survives. This is like the most robust result I've ever found. Okay, so there's pretty much, no matter what you do, there's always this discount for paintings painted by women. Okay, so why? Why is there this discount? Okay, so now we go through the stories, right? Is it um, talent, right? Women can't paint. Uh, and um, is it uh, style? Uh, or is it culture, right? What's the, what's the best explanation for this price difference? Uh, and uh, let me show you some first evidence why we think that the explanation really has to be institutions and culture. The top bar, what we show is that the price difference, this is basically the time trend in the price difference. Uh, so the blue bar is for all artists and then the red uh, line there is for um, uh, the artists who have at least 20 sales in our auction sample. So these are more seasoned artists uh, who have more than or at least 20 auction transactions uh, since 1970. Okay. Uh, and so what you see is um, uh, it starts negative, which means that there's a big price difference for paintings painted by women relative to men, and then it slowly converges up to zero. So the zero is actually at the top. Um, which means that the, the price gap is decreasing over time. Uh, but especially for the more established artists, it doesn't go away. 
Okay. So what that says is the, the price gap between paintings by men and paintings by women is changing over time. Immediately, that rules out a genetic explanation. Okay, because if it's genetics, it shouldn't change, right? Because it's not like, oh, women, you know, historically couldn't paint, but now all of a sudden women can paint. That doesn't hold water, right? It's not genetics. Okay, uh, so that's one reason why we think, you know, we can very easily rule out the, you know, women don't have the golden nugget story, right? Uh, and then we do a lot more in the paper. There's a lot of statistics behind this. Uh, for example, we show that, um, uh, so if you're a woman and you sell art in different countries, the same woman's painting will sell at a bigger discount relative to art by men in countries with more gender inequality. Okay, so there, what is interesting about that is you hold the talent of the artist fixed because it's the same person and they're just selling their art in different countries, but there's a bigger price difference for a woman relative to a man, depending on characteristics of the country, which can't be attributed to the artist. Okay, so that's another reason, another way in which we rule out that it's not some differential talent explanation. Okay, uh, and here also is uh, the graph down here uh, shows um, another result that suggests that uh, what we're finding is a cultural explanation. Uh, basically, this shows the correlation between the percent of women in parliament in different countries and the price gap between men and women's paintings. So the more women are in parliament in a country, the smaller the price gap between art by men and women. Okay. So what possible explanation is there for this finding? Well, it has to be culture, right? There's really very hard to come up with another explanation. It can't be style, it can't be you know, ability, because what would ability have to do with the percent of women in parliament, right? All right, so we think patterns like this completely blow the genetic story out of the water. Right. Now, what about style and taste? Maybe women have a different style. Uh, so we try to get that at this in different ways. It's difficult, right, because how do you sort of characterize the style of a painting in an easy to analyze way, it's very difficult, especially because we have 1.9 million transactions, right? Uh, so we can't look at every painting and say, well, what style does this one have, right? What style does that one have? Impossible, okay? Uh, so we do a topic analysis of titles of paintings, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, and then we also do two experiments. Uh, so in the first experiment, we show people paintings painted by real artists, uh, and we ask them, we don't show the name of the artist, and we ask the subjects of the experiment to guess whether the painting was painted by a man or a woman, okay? Uh, and I'll show you the results in a second. Um, and uh, the second experiment, we uh, created our own art, and you'll see it's not cool creation like you do at the, uh, here, um, it's, you know, I guess when academics try to create art, this is what we do. Um, uh, and so we create fake art, and then uh, we associate different names. So we associate randomly male and female names as artists belonging to the art, and then we ask people, how much do you like the art? And so the people see the, the artwork, the artwork, and they see the name of the artist, Right? Which, so the same artwork will have either a man or a woman's name associated with it. And then we say, well, um, you know, do you like it differently depending on whether the artist is a man or a woman? Okay, so these are the two experiments. Okay, uh, and now this is all also look, looking much more artistic than um, uh, it actually is. <clears throat> 
So uh, I had put up, I had wanted to put up this uh, slide just to show you that there's a lot of sort of technicalities underlying this. Um, and now it looks like it's much more creative than it actually is. Um, because the formulas don't actually look like that. But anyhow, so, so what do we do? So the first thing that we do is we look at the title. So we want to characterize the topics of the paintings. And we do that by looking at the titles. Okay, and so what we do is we take the words and the titles and we estimate the probability. So you, you, you take the title of a painting and you say, what's the probability that this painting was painted by a woman based on the words in the title? Now how do you do that? You take all the paintings painted by women and you look at all the words that they use and then you calculate these probabilities which this slide was going to explain but I didn't want to really explain I just wanted to show that there's some like, you know, this pretty sophisticated stuff. Okay. Okay. So now let, let me show you the fun stuff. Okay. So um, now these are just the individual probabilities of different words. Okay, uh, so in the left panel, we have the words that are disproportionately used by female artists. And on the panel on the right, we have the words that are disproportionately used by male artists. Okay, so now the word that is most used by female artists is uh, roses. Okay, so 15% um, of uh, the use of roses is um, by female artists. Okay, now what, what are the other words that female artists use? Uh, so it's flowers, still life, vase, white, blue, garden, bouquet, fruit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, children is down there. Number, number 17 is children. Okay, uh, now uh, here are the words that are least used by female artists, which means they're more used by men. Uh, cat, uh, Dutch, cattle, wooded, gentleman, river, sailing, peasant, his, cows, seascape, sheep, canal, port. So lots of ships and sheep and cattle are used by men and women have more flowers and fruit and maybe children. Okay, so they're you look at this, you say, well, maybe there, you know, there's something to it, right? So women do have a style. Women paint more roses and fruit, and men paint more you know, sea battles, and, and for some reason, they like cows and cattle <laughs> and sheep, right? Okay, so there could be something to that, but it's not that simple, okay? Why is it not that simple? Because actually, you know, 15% of the use of the word roses is by women, but that means the rest of the percentages, the 85% is used by men. Okay, so if you see a painting of the rose, it's 85% more likely to be painted by a man than it is by a woman. Okay, so while this suggests there may be some imbalance in the topics, it's not that straightforward because, of course, a lot of what's going on on the right is a time period effect, right? So women were just not painting at the time when people really liked to see lots of ships and cattle, which I would probably say people don't really paint nowadays, right? And the first word is Dutch, right? So there's definitely something going on here with the time period, okay? So while it may initially seem as if there's an imbalance in topics, it's not that straightforward. Okay, and just to illustrate this point, uh, let me show you some of the titles of the paintings um, and the actual artist's gender. Uh, so basically what we do, so those were the individual words that I showed you, and then what we do is we associate a probability to each title in our data set um, and the probability is, what's the likelihood this painting was painted by a woman based on the words in the title? Okay. Uh, so here we have the, the titles of the artworks that are most likely to have been painted by a woman according to our algorithm. Okay. Uh, so the first one is uh, roses and mixed flowers in pink vase. So we estimate it's a high likelihood painted by a woman. 
Uh, now, it turns out that the actual artist gender is indeed female. Okay, now the next one, mix flowers and lilies in a blue vase. Also turns out to be female artist. But the next one, we estimate 99.5% painted by a woman because it's pink, white, and red roses in a glass vase. Well, actually, the artist is male. Okay, the next one, pink roses in glass vase, girl in white. Artist is also male. Pink and white roses in a jug on a ledge, artist is also male. Next one, pink roses, peonies, lilies, and various, so the title is cut off, artist is also male. Okay, so the point is, is that um, it's not that easy, right? So it may look as if women have a style, but actually a lot of times the estimate, you know, our estimated probability that a painting is painted by a woman is wrong. Okay. Now, um, just to, this fails a bit, you know, this um, misclassification, uh, when we look at the paintings that have the lowest estimated probability of being painted by a woman. Um, so here, all the artists are male, and our algorithm correctly identifies them as having been very unlikely to have been painted by a woman. Um, let me read you some of these titles. Uh, Clipper Ship and Schooner in Rough Seas. We estimate a 0% that that was painted by a woman. Uh, Clipper Ship in Choppy Seas. Clipper ship at full sail on high seas. Steamer and sailing ship in choppy seas. Cavalry battle in hilly landscape. Clipper ship in rough seas. Shipping scene, clipper and schooner. Okay, so women just did not paint clippers. Okay. So here our algorithm works very well in predicting that these paintings were not painted by women. But for the other, uh, for uh, words or for titles that do not include things like um, ships and cattle and probably Dutch, our algorithm is not that effective. Okay. And again, what this illustrates is there's a time period component to this estimation, right? So in the time period when people were painting a lot of ships and cattle, uh, there were just not that many female painters. Okay, so in those cases, of course, our algorithm is very accurate because it predicts that the painter was male. Well, there were only men painting. So it's pretty easy to predict that it's painted by a man. Okay. Now, when there are men and women painting, basically, in those time periods, you can't tell very accurately. Okay. All right. So uh, is there such a thing as women's art? Uh, well, we do find that women are more likely to paint roses than cattle, uh, but more men paint roses than women. Okay, 85% of roses are painted by men, and only 15% of roses are painted by women. Okay, so it's not so clear that there's such a thing as women's style based on topics as suggested by the titles. Of course, you know, we're not looking at the paintings themselves, right? So that's why we do the experiments. But the topics as suggested by the titles doesn't really seem to, you know, suggest as women's art. Um, but suppose we take this seriously, and we do in our analysis, so we, we actually incorporate these probabilities into our analysis. Well, it turns out that people really like roses, okay? So the rose paintings, they sell at a much higher price than other paintings. In fact, most of the artwork that we estimate has a high probability of being painted by a woman based on the topics as suggested by the title sell for a much higher price. Okay. So this idea that maybe, you know, the style issue explains why women's art sells for less does not explain, is not correct. It's impossible because actually the predicted women's art sells for more. Okay, so it's actually the gender itself that matters in explaining why there's a price difference. It's not the topic or the style. Okay, so topics do not explain the price gap. 
Okay, so now we do some more experiments because, you know, this is like, you know, we've used the titles, but what about the paintings? You know, maybe there's a style that women have, I don't know, who, who can say, right? But this is an argument that people make, so we're, we try to take this seriously. Okay, so the first experiment, what we do is each subject in the experiment is shown a random selection of five out of ten paintings. So we have ten paintings, five of them are painted by men, and five are painted by women. Okay. Now, we don't show them who painted them, so they don't know, right? We just show them the paintings, and then we ask them to guess the gender. And then we put some other stuff, guess some other stuff, um, and then we ask them to rate the painting on a scale of one to 10 based on their sort of artistic appreciation. So we ask them, how much do you like this painting? And so what we're trying to get at there is um, what might you be willing to pay at an auction? Right? If you like it more, you should be willing to pay more. Okay, so this is what it looks like, and I know it's hard to see, but basically you have the picture, right? The subject sees the picture, and then the first question is, um, in your opinion, the painter is um, female or male, and then we ask some other stuff, and then at the bottom we say, how much do you like this painting, and there's a sliding scale. Okay, so that's the experiment. Okay, uh, so now there's a lot of numbers here, but I put them up because I think they're cool and I'll walk you through them. Uh, okay, so here on the left, I have the, uh, the 10 uh, paintings. So the, uh, the artist's name is on the left. The women come first and then the men come second. And then the artwork title is right next to that. And then you see the artist's gender. So the f five female and then five male. Um, and uh, there's several interesting things that come out of this experiment. Uh, so if you see the column there that says percent of male guesses, okay, basically for each artwork, for each artist, we know the percent of subjects who guessed that the art was painted, that the, oh, thank you, that the painting was painted by a man, okay, here in this column, okay. Uh, so, for this painting, which was painted by a woman, uh, so here is actually something that is slightly related to ships and clippers, uh, which traditionally people think are painted by men. Um, uh, for this, the subjects guessed 75%, or 75% of subjects guessed the painting was painted by a man. Okay. Uh, so the next painting, also by a woman, 61% guessed it was painted by a man, 71% for the next one, 34%, so this one is the lowest, so more people guessed that this painting was painted by a woman, uh, which this one is vase de fleur au pêche vert, so it's a flower, vase of flowers, right? And so people see, see the vase of flowers and think, oh, maybe it's painted by a woman, right? Um, the next one, again, more likely to guess it's a man, uh, here, slightly more likely to guess it's a woman, more likely man, more likely man, slightly less likely man, and more likely man. Okay. So on average, for the female artists, uh, subjects, 62% uh, of subjects guessed that the paintings were actually painted by a man. Right? So they were, they were painted by a woman, but they're more likely to think it was painted by a man. Uh, and the same for the male artists. So it's very, uh, very similar across the two categories of art. So for paintings painted by men, subjects were 62% likely to assign the gender male to the artist uh, than female. Okay, so on average, what this shows is that um, people see a painting and they think it's painted by a man. Or they're more likely to think it's painted by a man, right? Which probably makes a lot of sense given that we know that a lot of museums show art primarily by men, right? So if you're exposed to art a lot, you might think, well, more art is painted by men, so if I guess it's painted by a man, I'm probably not too far off, right? Okay, so that's sort of interesting. Um, another thing that's interesting is, uh, you know, the percent of correct guesses, okay? So for the female artists, only 37% of subjects were able to guess the gender of the artist correctly, 
And for the male artists, only 62% were able to guess the gender correctly. And if you average it, it's 49.9%, which is ba basically 50%, which means that it's indistinguishable from random, right? Because we have equal probabilities of being painted by a man or a woman in our sample, and the, sub and the subjects guess with 50% accuracy whether it's painted by a man or a woman, so basically they have no idea. Okay, so people look at a painting, they cannot figure out if it's painted by a man or a woman. They have no idea, okay. So that I think is really important, right? Because it shows, so we have the topic analysis, which, you know, and initially you think, oh, well, it really shows that women paint different art, and then, ma, actually not really true, right? Uh, now we have people looking at art, they can't guess, right? Okay. Now, uh, let's go to appreciation. So we did two things. We said, can you guess the gender, which is sort of trying to figure out, is there such a thing as women's art? And now, uh, we also had the question, how much do you like the art? Okay, now remember the experiment is they have to guess the gender, so they think they know the gender, and then they have to rate how much they like the art. And so obviously the question is, does their guess influence their appreciation? Uh, so, uh, like I said before, one thing that we found, so we also in this, um, uh, here we had the, the estimated probability, so based on the title, what's the likelihood that it was painted by a woman? Okay, so we had that. Um, and what we found is, um, which we also found in our other analysis, which I haven't shown you, uh, is that respondents like paintings that um, have a higher likelihood of being painted by a woman based on the words in the title, right? So I guess um, if you're uh, an artist who wants to make lots of money, you should go out and paint lots of roses uh, because people seem to pay for that um, for some reason. Um, but anyhow, uh, which is sort of interesting, but it also shows uh, that um, the bias that we're picking up is not driven by the topic, okay, the bias and the price. Okay, so that's the first thing. So respondents like paintings with female prevalent topics more, um, and on average, they are neutral towards paintings they guess were painted by women. So I guess that's good news, right? So on average, there was no bias towards paintings by women um, and uh, paintings that they thought were painted by men. However, uh, male respondents, affluent respondents, and respondents with more art exposure liked paintings that they thought were painted by women less. Okay, now this I think is important because who are male respondents, affluent respondents, and respondents, respondents with more art exposure most similar to? Probably people who buy art, right? Probably more men who are wealthy and who go to art museums are going to be buying art than otherwise, um, and they sort of systematically said that they preferred the art that they guessed was painted by women less. Okay, so here we have a culture effect kicking in. Right. Okay, so what we've done, what I've showed you so far, we've ruled out the genetic story, that was pretty easy. Uh, and we've ruled out the style story. That was pretty easy. Not so easy, but actually, you know, it's pretty clear. Um, and, um, you know, there's some evidence for attitudes, right? Okay, so then we did another experiment to try to get at this attitude issue a bit more. Um, and so here we created our own art. Okay, so what we do here now is we take the same artwork. So before what we did is everyone saw, you know, a random assortment of paintings painted by men and women. Uh, now we take the same artwork and we randomly assign male and female artist names to the painting. So now, of course, we couldn't take an actual artist's artwork and randomly assign different names to it, right? That would be like unethical and probably the artist would not like it very much. Right, because like, well, my artwork and you're randomly assigning names. So we had to create our own art. Okay, 
Um, and so what we did is we use, um, fortunately, uh, someone has done this. It's a very fancy process, and I tried to read the paper, and I'm very glad that we could avoid programming this up. Uh, there's actually this algorithm that uses deep neural networks, and don't ask me anything about it. I have no idea. Uh, but it creates artistic images. Okay, so it's some sort of fancy schmancy computing technique that creates artistic images. Um, and uh, uh, basically, there's a way to do it. You just go online and you do it. So hopefully now I'm not messing up someone's artistic you know, art class or something by saying that you can go and do this, right? But you, know, you guys don't get grades anyhow here, so it doesn't matter, right? Um, but so basically, this is how it works. Is so you, you get some random picture uh, from anywhere, and then you have a style, and then the, uh, this program generates a final picture that take, has basically the style of this superimposed on this input, okay? Which is, I think, sort of cool and, you know, it was fun to do this. Um, so basically, these are our fake pictures, and then we randomly assign uh, artist names. So this one had Jessica and Michael Smith, so it was either Jessica Smith or Michael Smith assigned to this picture. Uh, here we have this nice abstract was either Jennifer Johnson or Christopher Johnson, et cetera. So we had a bunch of these paintings, or well, paintings, um, and we assigned different artist names. Okay, so this is how the survey looks. So we s basically the subjects were thought that they were answering a survey about what makes art, art beautiful, uh, and the reason they thought that is because we showed the picture, and then underneath you see the artist's name, and then we said, how much do you like this painting? Okay, so that's all they saw. Okay, so now, um, actually, to be scientifically honest, I have to say our results from this experiment were less strong as for the other experiment, and one reason, I think, is that we didn't make the artist's name very prominent. The picture was very big, but this wasn't very prominent, which is, you know, we would have to do it again to see if that really is it, uh, explains it. Uh, however, we still find that affluent respondents with more art exposure, like paintings they think are painted by women, less. Okay, so again, respondents who seem more similar to auction participants, like art they think is painted by women, less. Okay, so uh, what I've shown you is that I think the genetics we've laid to rest, the style we've laid to rest, and basically we have a lot of evidence. I haven't even shown you most of our other evidence. We have a lot of evidence that culture is a major explanation for our results. Okay, so just to conclude, um, if you ask the question, why have there been no great women artists? I think we provide very convincing, very strong, like I said, this paper is like I've never seen results that are quite so uh, robust. Uh, we provide very strong evidence um, that uh, one explanation uh, is the nature of social institutions rather than in the nature of individual genius or the lack thereof. Okay. And as Alan writes, uh, women's art sells for less because it is made by women. Uh, I think our evidence is completely consistent with that. Okay. It's a fact that it's made by women that explains a large part of the discount. It doesn't mean that other factors are not also important. For example, historically, training may have played a role. Um, you know, but um, we find a large part of the discount is explained by the fact that the paintings are actually painted by women rather than by men. Uh, <clears throat> now, maybe for you guys, it doesn't, I don't have to put this last um, paragraph, but when I present this to a finance audience, uh, they said, well, why does it matter? And I think this paragraph by Nochlin uh, summarizes it very well because, um, you know, if women face these institutional barriers, we're basically losing out on potentially great art. And the way Nochlin describes it, she says, and while great achievement is rare and difficult at best, it is still rarer and more difficult if, while you work, you must at the same time wrestle with inner demons of self-doubt and guilt and outer monsters of ridicule or patronizing encouragement, neither of which have any specific connection with the quality of the artwork as such. So does it matter? I think it does, right? So thanks very much. I look forward to hearing your responses. Hello, what a great crowd.
This is excellent. I'm happy to see this. You know, this is such an important issue, and it's wonderful to see people coming out and wanting to learn more about why this is the case and, and perhaps what we can do about it, um, more importantly. Um, I just, I want to thank you. Um, Renee, that was that was extraordinary. I read the paper twice, but but hearing it presented, it just really hammered home those statistics and the thoroughness with with which you and your partners looked at this is 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 really beyond comprehension. It's sort of, I mean, something like 1.9 million results you looked at. I mean, it's really extraordinary. So thank you for bringing it forward. And as I was listening to you, I was thinking, God, we've all got to start put together some sort of book. You know, those of us that are working in this field so we can really hopefully make something happen in a more impactful way as opposed to, you know, us writing these little siloed papers that we hope we can present, right? It would be wonderful if we can somehow get all this material together and, and um, really get it out there for, for people to start learning what's going on. Um, I loved that you, that you quoted Linda, of course, because she's one of my favorite people or was in the world. And one of the things that she said um, to me always was that, um, unfortunately, and this is a quote, we still live and work in an art world in which high prices rather than high qualities are the touchstone of success, end quote. And I think that that perfectly resonates with what we're talking about this evening. I wanted to go to um, my presentation here for a sec. I think it's right there. And, um, Wait, let me see, bring it up that way, that's easier. So this is um, just a quote from my article that I wrote for Art News in 2015 that was called, um, well basically the subtitle was Sexism in the Art World. It's probably the easiest way to remember it. And what it talks about here, it relates very much to um, you know, the, the discussion tonight, is that basically the availability of works by women artists at galleries, in the market, et cetera, has a huge amount of impact on their value, right? Because if you have an exhibition show at Chime and Reed or 303 Gallery, you're gonna have maybe press coverage, you might have some collectors buying work, um, museums might come by, curators to include you in the Whitney Biennial, and so on and so forth. So the availability of works by women artists at galleries directly affects their market and their monetary value. And that's particularly an area of the art world where women are unequal, and that's what we saw um, this evening. Let me see if I can get this. This is one of my favorite posters. Um, I know, I don't, is that good? Is it gonna do it now? Let's see. No, it's still gonna do that. That's all right, don't worry, I'll scroll down. <laughs> um, so I thought you'd appreciate this. This is from, um, there's a really wonderful, um, a collective, an artist collective called Gallery, Gallery Tally, and this is one of theirs that relates to the art market, where women are more likely to be seen in a painting than on the auction block. Now I just want to show a few other things that relate so that we can open up the topic um, this evening with some other data, and I think this is a fantastic piece from 1985. Uh, the Gorilla Girls talking about the sort of mega buck prices that men are getting uh, versus women. And in particular, they're talking about the $17.7 .7 million painting that was purchased by Jasper Johns. And then below, you can see that you can buy one work by every single one of those artists for the same price. Um, another kind of, I don't know, um, Renee, if you looked at this as well, but there's this amazing, there's tons of publications that are out that, like Artnet and Art Price and Kunst Compass, that look at who are the most, um, you know, who you should buy. So it's, it caters to billionaires and multimillionaire collectors, and it tells you these are the people you should buy if you want to spend your money well. And so I just pulled up some of the last 10 years for you so you could take a look. It's always two women, never more than two women. One time it was none, as in 2009. But it's always Gerhard Richter, Bruce Nauman, Rosemary Trockel, George Bazalitz, who said that women can't paint, as you may recall in, the last, in her presentation, and Cindy Sherman. But in the top 100, there are only six women, so um, by average. So six out of 100 are the artists that you should be purchasing according to this major publication. Um, likewise with Artnet, the top living artists through 2016, you can see that there are three here. 
out of 100. Um, this is one of my favorite things that I do, and I always post these on, on Facebook. And I say, thoughts, ideas, what do you think? So the highest price paid for a dead artist, um, Barrett Morisot 10.9, but if we scroll down a little here, you'll see the, um, the killer, is um, Francis Bacon is 86.3. Now this does not include the one, the recent one, the recent, um, what was it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> that sold for, what was it, like 300 million or something. Um, and I'll, I'll scroll ahead here. The highest price paid for a dead artist in 2014 then became Joan Mitchell on the top left and other Francis Bacon for 142. But look at the price differential, 11.9, 142. Honestly, I'd prefer Joan Mitchell, but that's just me. Um, Highest price paid as of 2018 for a dead artist. Top left is Georgia O'Keeffe, 44.4, and still the Francis Bacon. This is interesting. The highest price paid for a living artist as of 2013. We have 58.4 million, but what I love to emphasize there is that's an addition of five. That is not a unique work of art. Compared with the Yayo Kusama on the bottom right, 7.1 million. We're getting a little bit better for women when we hit 2015. Still, the Jeff Koons has the record, but down below we have a Katie Noland for 9.8 million. Again, the differential is shocking. A little better, a few weeks ago, Jenny Saville on the bottom right just sold a painting for 12.4 million. Still nothing compared to the Jeff Koons. So I like to leave with him. And this is Artnet again, the top lots by living artists, right? So the top auction lots. And there's not one woman on that list of 100. So that should give you just a little bit of a sense of the reality of our art market here in the US. And I, look, I always look at Christie's and Sotheby's. So um, I just want to throw that out there. That's why I wanted to just give a little introduction first, because it really, it hammers home, I think, this, all of these ideas that were put forth, you know, um, earlier this evening, and I hope that we can talk a little bit more about.